Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of uh, Practical uh, Show Tech. As you can see, Pete is sporting the latest in uh, communications headgear from what, 19, well, I don't even want to guess. But you, how do you, sound, you, weren't, you weren't even born yet. You weren't oh even my born. God, it sounds so clear. You <laughs> must have like a carbon to USB adapter. You're going to be have having those on bestaudio.com now? Exactly. Okay. All right. Well, you know, welcome aboard, folks. We're, um, we're continuing our RF discussion. And again, part of what we've learned is RF is hot. I mean, literally, it's a hot topic. People are loving it. Coming into springtime, uh, we're, we're getting focused on this. And uh, who better to talk about it than professional wireless systems, right? And, uh, you know, as we were talking through, you know, all the different uh, topics that are, that are out there, uh, me personally, this is one of my favorites. RF over fiber, um, this is a burgeoning segment of our industry that, frankly, I think a lot of us, know very little about we've just gotten so used to hey i can convert anything to fiber right now our to over fiber is not new it's been around quite a while it's just recently become affordable and i'll use that in air quotes affordable it's the fiber from my antenna i that's mean my fiber that's a fiber from my headset this is a it's an optical headset it's an optical headset so it's a carbon to optical to usb so even more money yep. so um what we're seeing is we just expect this right i go to my network switch i can add an sfp i uh i can now send anything anywhere is is it fair to say that that fiber will replace coax eh, it'll be a while but it is here right now so enough of my introduction there mac pete welcome uh, we got Cody and Gary with us uh, from PWS. Uh, but before we get into the topic, I see more people are piling into the room. Again, six feet. Keep your distance. Exactly. Exactly. Close. 141 right. megahertz at one wavelength. Okay, we got plenty of space. Plenty of space. So um, I'm going to uh, let uh, Mac and Pete kind of talk about our Q&A. And this one, I will tell you, is going to be really busy Q&A. So listen up to everybody. Pete's going to give you the rundown here. Yes, the slides are available in your handouts. I'm just going to put that out there right now because that's a question we'll get later. Yes, this is being recorded. And then I would ask that everybody that's on the screen today tell our audience at different points today, yes, this is being recorded. So <laughs> anyhow, I'm going to hop off here and uh, let Pete and Mac take it from this point and then hand it off. Mac, go ahead. But, yeah, not only is this being recorded, but it's available for viewing later. Uh, on, on the website. Um, oh, I, I wanted to add, this is being recorded. <laughs> and you can watch it tomorrow, approximately uh, this time to see it. If you have it, if you happen to be here late, and if you're not here right now, then I'm not gonna tell this again. So yeah. on your little control panel on the right-hand side there, you'll see there's a place to ask questions. And not all questions will be viewable to all people. So go ahead and ask your questions, type them in, and we will relay them to Cody and Gary. Um, and uh, when they come up to absolutely nothing to say anymore, then they'll answer your questions, or maybe earlier, who knows? So Cody and Gary, go ahead. All right, thanks, Pete, Mac. All right, so intro to wireless distribution. Uh, let's see. As was mentioned, I'm Gary. I'm an applications engineer for professional wireless systems. With me is Cody, who's an RF coordinator and also works on business development for professional wireless systems. Uh, as we get rolling into this, we wanted to just thank some folks who helped us out with this slide deck. There's a lot of, a lot of evolutions of this material out there, and it's really been great to be able to kind of collaborate with these guys. Uh, I'll give you an, a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, with RF distribution. We're going to start with RF spectrum. Uh, the RF spectrum is something we've, that has been talked about with other webinars you, that you all have probably seen. So we're just going to kind of roll through that briefly. It is in the slide deck if you want to review it in some more depth later. 
Um, but then we're actually going to spend a bit more time on antennas and filtering, amplification and cabling to get into kind of our two key topics, which is RF over fiber and then some on multiple zone antenna systems. So we want to give you some brief background to start and then really start digging into some of the more advanced application topics. Uh, Cody, do you want to talk a little bit about your 80-20 rule to get rolling? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it was a couple webinars ago, but it was either Kelly or Mac, and uh, they had uh, spoken a little bit about the 80-20 rule on the opposite side of things, um, being an RF tech and when to invest in that and become uh, kind of a true blue RF guy and uh, the cost that comes with uh, getting a spectrum analyzer and software coordination. Um, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we kind of turned that and it was the catalyst for what we're going to talk about today with us, our Pareto principle. Um, basically, 80% of your system performance is 20% of your RF info. Uh, your key principles, uh, your best practices are what's really going to get uh, the peak of your system performance. And then that turns into modifying that for your environmental and uh, client compromising situations or any of that stuff that will actually modify your principles. So um, that's kind of what we're going to work through. And I thought that was kind of a fun uh, lead into what we're going to do here today. Um, so the first thing we're going to start with is, uh, I think, RF spectrum and uh, getting into the depths of that. OK, so FCC rules, which everybody loves so much. Uh, we like to start with this idea of you know FCC part 15, which talks about interference. Right, so part 15 rules say that the RF devices you're operating may not cause harmful interference. And if you receive any harmful interference, including, including interference that may cause undesired operation, it has to accept it. So there's a lot of things out there that can interfere with your wireless systems. It's something you need to be aware of, and it's something that may cause undesired performance. Uh, and part 74 is something that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, part 74 operation are the, the rules that govern operation of a lot of the wireless systems that we use, microphones, IM, IFB, wireless intercom systems. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today will be UHF TV band because that's still the main area where we operate a lot of these wireless systems. We'll talk a little bit about VHF and then some about what I've been calling alternate frequency bands like STL band, ISM bands. I think we'll touch very briefly on AvTrack band, DECT band, and that sort of thing. But it's just, when you're starting with these wireless systems, it's good to understand where are my systems operating and who else is there. Uh, so part 74, unlicensed operation in the UHF TV band, you're allowed to operate in 470 to 608, up to 50 milliwatts. Licensed operation in the UHF TV band can be allowed up to 250 milliwatts. So this is our plug for everybody should really get a part 74 license if they're eligible for it because it gives you some advantages in terms of what you're able to do with the systems, power levels you're able to operate on. You can see the next part here, we're talking about the duplex gap and you'll see a graphic that illustrates the duplex gap a little bit later. But there's a portion of the duplex gap that's set aside for unlicensed operation and there's another portion of it that's set aside for licensed operators. Uh, also, there is the ability to operate on top of DTV channels provided you're indoors and your TV channel is being received at a, a relatively low level. In this case, it doesn't exceed minus 84 dBm. So that's another advantage to being a licensed operator is if you're trying to operate a high channel count, you're pretty squeezed for space, you're able to use low power DTV. Uh, and licensed operation can be easier it can make it easier to apply for protection from white space devices by registering with online white space spectrum databases provided those are available to you that's still a bit of a open question but if white space devices become a thing then uh, we've got additional protection for from them as licensed operators uh, and remember even if you have a part 74 license you're still a secondary user to any licensed broadcast tv station any T-band public safety radios or other licensed primary operators. So TTV transition, again, this has been talked about a bit, but we want to make sure that everybody's on the same page about when we're talking UHF TV, back 10 years ago or more, UHF TV was all the way up to 806 meg. But 
Uh, as of 2010, all of 698 to 806 went away from TV broadcasts. So if you've been operating wireless mics five, six, seven years ago, what's listed in the lower part of this slide for low VHF, high VHF, and UHF TV was the area you're probably used to operating systems in. But now what the last couple years has brought us is this new repack, the 600 megahertz incentive auction. So it's a second repack of TV into a smaller portion of the UHF TV spectrum. And so what we got rid of with the second auction was essentially everything above 608 meg. So 608 to 698 went away. Uh, and then this graphic shows you a couple areas that are exceptions to that rule of we don't operate above 608 anymore. There's a little two meg chunk from 614 to 616. And then there's that duplex gap where we can operate from 653 to 663, again, depending on if you're licensed or unlicensed. Uh, the reason for all this is the new cellular band that's getting rolled out. And you've probably heard about this from T-Mobile because they've made quite a push to, and I think, you know, all of us in pro audio and working with wireless actually appreciate T-Mobile trying to get the word out about the areas that they're operating in and, you know, when this is all rolling out. And so T-Mobile is one of the major winners of the 600 meg auction. This uh, new cellular band is called band 71. So if you hear cellular folks talking about band 71, what they mean is the 600 meg band that we saw back here that's broke up into different uplink and downlink blocks, A through G. Uh, other winners in the auction were Dish Network, Comcast, some other folks that just bought Spectrum as folks that wanted to own Spectrum. Uh, if you want more info on that, go to the T-Mobile website for how mobile works. One interesting development recently is that T-Mobile has applied for and received an STA, a special temporary authorization for using more of the 600 meg than what they won in the auction. And so if you happen to be running wireless microphones somewhere during this time, really rely on your scans and make sure that you're aware of your RF environment in any of these uplink and downlink blocks. We're just about at the end of the repack. So we're in phase nine right now of 10. And this graph gives you a good uh, idea of what's gonna happen very soon. July 3rd, 2020, July 3rd of this year is when all the new rules governing the 600 meg band are in force nationwide. And so be aware of that. And for those of you who have, you know, are in these last couple phases, you may not have seen TV move yet, but you're going to see TV move by July. Uh, the possible small exceptions to this are some low power DTV channels, but that's, you know, they'll move within another year or two, it seems. And most of those folks have moved already or have gone off the air. All right, Cody, what do we got coming in for questions so far? Uh, most everything we got so far um, is going to be cable related as far as uh, fiber systems. Okay. If you want to wait on that for a little bit um, yeah, or if you just want to get the fiber. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll try and breeze through this quick. Uh, available spectrum post auction is exactly what we've been talking about. Uh, here's the kind of state of the wireless world right now, including a couple of those alternate bands like ISM, STL, Avtrack, Deck Band, et cetera. Uh, another thing to be aware of understanding your RF landscape is T-band public safety channels. And so if you're in these specific markets listed on the right-hand column, you want to be aware that public safety radio, two-way radio, is operating in TV channels that are in the low part of your band, somewhere between 470 and 512. And there's the specific TV channels per market. So if you're one of those markets, besides excluding your local TV broadcasts, you also need to exclude these channels from areas where you're able to operate. Uh, and this is a very cool graphic that hopefully will show up to you guys. Cody put this together today. Well, modified the one we had today. So you can see, here's what's happening if you're in a large market like Chicago. You have a first phase of the repack where TV moves down into the lower part of the band and then you have another phase of the repack that's gonna be complete here just completed in March actually. So the important point here is that you used to have 14 UHF TV channels available and now you went down to 10 and then now down to five. And so 
it's just reduced spectrum to operate in, which is a concern. So as we start talking about RF distribution, we're going to talk about antennas first to think about how do we get these radio signals either out into the air or how do we pick them up from the air and then how do we distribute them. So uh, something I like to start with when we're talking about radio waves is the kind of real fundamentals of you've got an electric field and a magnetic field and that field is varying and as it cycles up and down you have this concept of how fast is it cycling and that's the frequency in hertz and then how does that uh, relate to a physical wavelength or a size of the wave. So here we're explaining that one wavelength is roughly two feet at 470 megahertz. That's the bottom end of UHF TV. And then it's roughly 1.6 feet at 616 meg, which is the, sort of the upper end of where UHF TV operation is going to be for a lot of folks now. So think about that size as you start to think about how big do your antennas need to be, because antenna sizing is very directly related to wavelength or some fractional wavelength. It could be a half wave or a quarter wavelength. And with that, I think we're going to have Cody talk a little bit about common antenna types. All righty. So uh, as far as antenna goes, you know, we're uh, looking at the basis of our system here and uh, what we want to do to be able to build the most uh, sturdy system that we can. So we have lots of different antenna types. Um, your ideal isotropic radiator, your ground plane or dipole omni antenna, log periodic dipole array antenna, also known as an LPDA, um, a hemispherical spiral antenna or a helical. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to look at kind of what those mean and what some of those are. So um, as far as our isotropic antenna goes, um, you have your uh, Isotropic antenna, which is basically a theoretically perfect omnidirectional radiator antenna. Um, this is not a real antenna, but it's useful for comparative gain specifications. Um, the spec for DBI, so when you're looking at an antenna um, and the specs on it, and it has six DBI of gain, um, that's going to be in relation to your isotropic antenna. Um, as far as your dipole antenna is concerned, um, these are relatively narrow band. Um, your vertical dipole is omnidirectional on the horizontal axis. Um, this is going to describe the forward gain of an antenna compared to a half wave dipole. So uh, if you ever see the DBD uh, explanation of this instead of DBI, um, you're going to basically be uh, 2.15 of a variation from a dipole antenna to an isotropic antenna. Um, all right, for your Cody, direction, I'm behind, I'm behind you one on a slide here, and I wanted to hit a couple of questions real briefly. Um, we've got one a good comment that, remember that T-band radio isn't just public safety. In a lot of areas, it's public safety, but there's also private and commercial land mobile radio that can operate there, as I was running through that. Uh, also, there's a question about the TV databases and it's important to mention that with the TV databases, right now with all the repack that's happening, the information that is available from the FCC isn't necessarily the most up to date. So it's always a good idea to do a scan on site. Uh, you don't uh, necessarily get the greatest information from the or most up to date information from the FCC. I know speaking about the PWS IS software, you know, we will get that data from the FCC daily and update the database in IAS, but it's still not always accurate. So it's good to take a scan from your show site when at all possible. Um, and then there's a question about white space databases, which we should probably talk about uh, maybe at our webinar next week, because that's a little more involved topic than we want to get into right now. So I'll jump back to you with uh, you went through the isotropic antenna and then you were talking about the dipole antenna, right? Correct. Uh, we were just finishing that up, uh, just the relation from uh, the dipole to the isotropic antenna. Um, and then we were moving into directional antennas. Um, so these are going to be probably a lot more common for um, the higher end market. Um, a lot more well used. Um, so these are generally wideband antennas. Um, they'll cover 470 to 900 roughly. 
Um, these are known, uh, you may have not heard it as an LPDA. Um, you could have heard this referenced as a bat wing, a shark fin, or a paddle antenna. Um, the one we have on here is the Professional Wireless S8090. Um, this has 6 dBi of passive gain on axis. Um, and we're gonna dive into a little deeper on that on the next slide, um, as well as the nominal 70 degrees of beam width. Um, what are the variations of this and what do those numbers actually mean? Um, is gonna be uh, something that Gary's gonna dive a little deeper into on the next slide. But um, one thing we wanna know about that is a lot of this is frequency dependent as well. So these aren't numbers to live and die by, um, and they do exist in, in different variations. Um, another thing we wanna mention um, that was you know mentioned on past webinars is a lot of these polar plots uh, are going to uh, seem like polar plots that are going to look very similar to you as if a microphone, if you were viewing a microphone polar plot. Um, so as you're deploying antennas, you want to make decisions based on that information as well. Yeah, so what we're looking at on this slide is a couple of polar patterns, the vertical and horizontal polar four of typical LPDA. And if you remember from the last slide, we talked about it having 6 dB of gain on axis. And so you can see from the typical horizontal pattern that you're writing about plus six. And so, yeah, what you wanna think about is you're at plus six on axis. And then as you start moving off axis, that gain starts to go down, but it goes down rather gradually. And so uh, half power beam width is something we talk a lot about. And remember that half power is three dB down. So if we're looking at this graph, we can say that we're at plus six on axis, and then we're at minus three at, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 degrees or so off axis. So 35 to 40, that's where you get this idea that it's a 70 degree, pat uh, 70 degree pattern on the antenna. But again, as you get further off axis, it's not like you go from excellent gain to minus 20 dB of gain. It continues to sort of roll off gradually. And then at some point you're only as good as an omni antenna. And then at some point when you're around behind the antenna, you're far worse than what an omni antenna would get you. So you wanna think about that sort of reciprocal property of all these directional antennas that as you get more and more forward gain directly on axis, you typically get less gain off to the sides and off axis. So in a normal show situation, if you're setting up your antennas on the side of a stage, aiming at the stage where you get some gain and you know with the back of the antenna away from the stage where you don't need to pick anybody up, it's usually a good choice to use a directional antenna in an application like that. And as Cody mentioned, this does change with frequency and so you've got a specified frequency range for your antenna and you want to think about not only the gain on axis and off axis but the gain at a particular frequency if you're within the bandwidth of the antenna if you're maybe outside of that and how wide a bandwidth does your particular antenna have all right take it away cody um and so then just the last uh style of antenna that we're going to talk about here um just yet another very common uh, powerful tool in your arsenal is the helical antenna. Um, these are again going to be relatively wideband um, for 7900. Uh, so our four turn helical, um, the one you're seeing at the top there, is the Professional Wireless S8089. Um, this has 10 to 12 dBi of passive gain on axis, so you're going to have definitely more forward gain than your uh, directional antenna. Uh, 63 degrees bandwidth and a front to back ratio or rear rejection of 12 dB. So again, just really looking at those polar patterns, trying to make sure you know what the best tool for your job is. Um, our newer antenna, um, the two turn helical uh, that we have is going to give you just a little bit more wider beam width um, and just a little less passive gain on axis. But um, again, you're just kind of picking the right tool for the job there. So um, just a quick run through on those um, to kind of get us further down the rabbit hole here of what we want to build for our optimal system um, to get into our fiber and multi-zone uh, discussion. Uh, another thing we wanted to look at really quick that we felt was uh, very important for people to kind of understand the differences about is diversity schemes. Um, everyone kind of hears the word diversity. Um, they know that their gear works with diversity, but not really understanding what it means. 
Um, there's several different types uh, we're going to touch here on predictive or switching diversity uh, in comparison to true diversity. Um, predictive and switching, um, you've got two antennas that are connected to a switch that feeds a single receiver section. A microprocessor monitors the RF level to predict when a dropout might occur at an individual antenna. Uh, the microprocessor switches antennas before the dropout. What this is saying is your two antennas that are connected to your single receiver, your receiver then is making uh, algorithmic and mathematical equations as far as which antenna is going to be the best to use. So it's combining those two and switching between one or the other to give you um, your output. As far as true diversity is concerned, you've got two antennas that are now connected to two different independent receiver sections. So this audio combining circuit is now making the differentiate, differentiating between the two, but it can combine them, it can separate them, and you've got your two outputs now that you can be using uh, basically either antenna, um, which is a, a huge uh, portion to that as far as um, you know robustness of your signal. Yeah, yeah, and probably a big driver of expense in some of these systems if you've got yeah. one radio per audio channel or if you've got two radios per audio channel. We had a couple um, of questions come in about... Yeah, I was just going to ask you. Yeah, and so. uh, right-hand and left-hand circular polarization. And so if you look at the antennas shown here, these have a right-hand circular polarization or right-hand spin to it. It's basically the twist of the antenna is right hand uh, and then yes PWS does make a left hand circularly polarized antenna those are available by special order there's some applications where it can be helpful to have uh, right hand and left hand antennas now if you're doing a point-to-point -point link uh, you actually want both of the antennas to have the same polarization so your transmit antenna right hand and your receive antenna right hand aiming at each other but the flip side of that would be if you had two right-hand antennas for receive and you wanted to put a transmit antenna nearby, it can be helpful to have a left-hand polarized antenna nearby because it doesn't get picked up into your right-hand polarization adjacent to it as easily as if it was matched up. I just um, wanted to expand on that question, which wasn't entirely answered. How do you determine, how do you determine right versus left? You stand in back of the antenna, and then if you if you're if it's going clockwise from you, is that right-handed, or is that left-handed? Yeah. So if you look at a right-hand antenna from the front, the twist will be clockwise, and if you look at a left-hand antenna, a left antenna from the front, the twist will be counterclockwise. Well, well, the twist is going to be the same whether you're standing in the back or the front. It doesn't matter if it's clockwise it's going to be right-handed. You can stand in the front or the back. It's still going to be clockwise. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah sure. Sure. So, so clockwise yeah. is right-handed, right? I believe so, yeah. And and anti-clockwise is left-handed. Yeah, right. Better yep. to just call it clockwise and anti-clockwise. Yeah, and, yeah, and I tend to use the PWS antenna, so I tend to just remember that Ours are right hand by default. And so unless you know you've got something that's specially not uh, right handed, it'll it'll be a right hand twist to it. Uh, we got anything else coming in for questions? Um, yeah, so uh, just to answer one really quick, um, it was uh, basically asking the gain pattern uh, between the new and the old helical. Um, we showed that on the slide prior. Um, Basically, the two turn, uh, you've got 9 to 11 dBi passive gain on axis where your uh, older four turn helical had 10 to 12. So a little more um, passive gain, but you've got a wider beam width on that. Yeah, it's um, not tremendously different between the two turn and the four turn. Um, and then obviously that trade off is the two turn is a, a bit wider. And another, uh, another change that was made was uh, we used to have a, a copper tuning strip uh, that was inside of the helical um, to tune that antenna, which Gary's uh, got his uh, mouse on right there, I believe. Yep. And uh, on the new one, we actually have a chipset that is mounted on the antenna. So it's a little uh, less difficult to uh, get it out of tune, uh, especially if you use it as a shirt or a belt pack holder. Yeah, it's a small circuit board with some passive components and it's just there for impedance matching. 
Um, so let's see, uh, 8091 and 4540, are they the same antenna? Only one is covered. 8091 and 45. Yeah, so the, okay. the, 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 the domed helical, if you, if you will, or the, the helical antenna with that black dome covering it, and then the one next to it, yeah, they're the same two-turn helical antenna inside. One has a dome covering it, the other one doesn't. Yep. Um, and then let's see, are we caught up here? We also have, um, is there a reason for 63 degrees and 72 degrees for four and two turn helicals respectively? Yeah, I think that it's important to remember that this is sort of a nominal beam width and this is all, like a lot of these things frequency dependent. And so we're kind of giving you an average uh, that also tends to be a little bit wider at lower frequencies and narrower at higher frequencies with this specific antenna. So the, the thing to remember is that a four-turn helical is going to be narrower than an LPDA or a two-turn helical. You know, so that's that's the bigger deal. And again, it's not giant gain changes between these two antennas, and it's it's not a giant gain change between a other types of directional antenna. Like people may be familiar with a Sennheiser A5000 CP, which has a kind of a similar gain uh, to our two-turn helical, but um, one thing I guess maybe we should touch on a little bit more is that the circular polarization is a pretty big advantage of these antennas. Almost more than, you know, huge gain differences. You want to tailor something with the right beam width to the area you need to cover, and you want to take advantage of that circular polarization because in a lot of cases, the other side of this, like if it's an IEM transmit antenna, the other side of this will be just a simple dipole antenna or a little whip antenna on a on a you know received body pack, and so you get some significant advantage of having a circularly polarized antenna sending out a wave that is much less sensitive to the orientation of the body pack on the other end of the of RF of this RF link. All right. Um, and I think we just had one left here. These do add up very quickly. <laughs> um, will the tuning strip be replaced in newer four turn production? Yes. Well, yeah, we're going to the there's not really a, a disadvantage at all to the tuning strip based on the testing we've done. It's just more consistent. And so it's, a, it's really a manufacturing improvement for us. Okay. Um, all right, I think we can move on here now. Um, right. So I talk about these awesome antenna deployments? Yes, awesome. <laughs> they are fantastically awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to elaborate on this just a little bit before I turn it over to Gary to really dive deep into uh, now building your multi-zone system uh, now that we kind of have our backbone built. Um, so common mistakes in antenna deployment. Um, this is uh, kind of just the backbone of your system. Uh, really wanting to make sure that you have the best situation uh, presented for your um, RF environment. So. Not being aware of your environment um, can be things like TV or antenna farms, TV towers, uh, having your null facing away from that, uh, just anything within that environment, poor placement. Uh, is there reflective surfaces around? Um, are you uh, in an area that you can't see the antenna? Um, inadequate spacing. Um, Gary talked a little bit about uh, a wavelength as far as how to calculate that and what that means. Um, if your antennas aren't a wavelength apart, um, that's not considered best practice. You wanna have at least minimum that. Um, wider than that is okay. Um, you don't gain anything by that, but you allow to have uh, basically a different, um, you have the ability to let your antenna look at a different, the wavelength differently if it's wider. So it's not necessarily gonna gain you anything as far as gain is concerned. Uh, but you have more opportunity for a diversity to kind of look at it differently. Yeah, um, and this is one of those rule of thumb kind of things where, you know, you have people tell you, well, you need at least a quarter wavelength to even call it diversity. Yeah. If you're if you've got two remotely mounted antennas, the recommendation is typically you want to be at least a wavelength apart, uh, and then until you get at least six wavelengths apart, it you're not really covering any larger area with it but at some point you might be spacing them further than six wavelengths apart because you want to cover more area and you're okay with that gain difference between your two antenna locations um 
so yeah, uh, the other thing that you have there is um, poor line of sight as far as your antennas are going. Uh, so you have the idea of the Fresnel zone, uh, which we won't get super deep into, but it's basically the eye or the oval that your antenna is looking at. Um, what is within that zone that will basically deflect or reflect anything um, from that signal. Uh, so we kind of look at it, uh, the analogy with that is if you're standing behind a guy at a concert, um, you can't see the stage at all. Uh, that would kind of be the same thing as being without of that Fresnel zone. Uh, even going above that person, you still have um, basically no sight below him. So as long as that whole oval is uh, has something obscuring it, then you're still out of that Fresnel zone, um, trying to keep it completely open. Um, and then, of course, just poor choice of polar pattern. Uh, again, as we kind of looked at um, for like a microphone at a concert, basically, trying to make sure that you're choosing the right polar pattern for the job. Um, all these things play into intended deployment. Um, and again, that kind of plays into that 80-20 rule that we were talking about, trying to make sure that you've got the best situation uh, that you can with all the compromises that you need to make. Um, so now we'll kind of hop into filters and everything you need to build your fiber and multi-zone system. Yeah, and we've got a couple more questions coming in. People got a lot of lot of questions about helical antennas, I think. So I'm going to jump back to that so, briefly. Uh, and I'll get these Let's ready see. for you here. Um, so there was one comment the... about the old right-hand rule. If you think about the right-hand rule for a magnetic field around a, a piece of wire, that that also works for figuring out the twist of an antenna. If you think about your thumb pointing in the direction of the antenna and then your fingers are wrapping around in the direction of the twist. I don't know if that works or not, but that was one yes, of the it does. Yes, it uh -oh. does. Okay. It does. You don't, your thumb doesn't have to point the direction of the antenna. It can point directly into the antenna. The same thing will be true. Okay. What's the, the direction of the twist? The direction uh, of the twist would be the curve of your hands. Like, you're pointing this way. If you're pointing here into the antenna, the twist is going clockwise. But here's my hand going clockwise. And if, um, I'm, doing left, if I'm doing a left hand, the twist is going counter counterclockwise. Sure, sure. We had a comment about uh, different FCC databases, which we'll touch on a little more during the IAS webinar. But there is a CDBS and an LMS for those of you who are into FCC databases, and currently the LMS is the most up-to-date for TV stations. Uh, we had, uh, let's see, a question about... Uh, uh, we've got, what oh, is the, 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 the... Yeah, the, the dome and the 4050, yes, to the same antenna. What else are we looking at here? What is this dome covering for on the dome? Oh, antenna? yeah. Right, yeah, it is, it's literally there to protect the element. I mean, when we first came out with the domed antenna, the thing that we didn't expect so much was people were storing things inside of the tube of the old clear helical antennas. And so that would bend up the tuning strip, that would sometimes peel the copper off of the inside of the plexiglass tube. And so we wanted to protect the element with the dome. Okay. Uh, A5000 CP, yeah, it's a spiral element in an A5000 CP, and I think we had that shown here. If you look on the antenna yep. slide, this is what that spiral element inside an A5000 CP looks like. So it's also a circularly polarized antenna. Um, it, whether you uh, whether or not you think of it as a traditional helical, I think uh, I've heard people say either way, but it's it's a circularly polarized antenna, and it's a spiral element. Uh, how do you tune a helical, number of turns, or diameter of the turn? So I guess they're talking about how it's tuned in production, I guess, rather than with the tuning strip. Um, well, as far as the helical antenna frequency range, obviously the size of the tube is a, a factor. Uh, the distance between the twists is a factor. You need a, an appropriately sized ground plane behind it. That's the screen on the back of it. There's a pretty cool online calculator for designing your own helical antennas that I should add into some links later to that if that's what they're wondering about. Just like what what are the physical properties of these helical antennas that matters as far as performance, in, uh, particularly in the frequency ranges that we're using them in. 
Uh, here's a quick one. Does moving the mic stand mount on the back of the helical affect the tuning of the antenna? No. No, you can have the mount on either side. It's it's connecting into the ground or connecting into the area where there's the ground plane. That's not the driven element of the antenna. Uh, um, and you might notice some of the older uh, PWS antennas had a machine block on them that had the mic stand thread on one side and the smaller threads on the other side. And now the new mount has them both on the same side, so you don't have to flip them around anymore, which is nice. Uh, this is a fun one. What were they storing in the helical antenna? <laughs> uh, I've seen cables in there. I've there. seen yeah. t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, what else? T-shirts, belt packs, microphones, uh, pretty much anything you can think of has been stored in that. Yeah. Um, okay, this will be a really fun one. Uh, elaborates a little further on the Fresnel zone. Um, if the Fresnel zone is so important, why is it that IEM antennas are sometimes seen so low or underneath the stage? Right. So you talked about your 80-20 rule at the beginning, right? So And this directly reflects that. <laughs> you've got all these different things that impact performance. And so sometimes you'll have a, a situation where to get direct line of sight, you're way off stage, backstage. Mm -hmm. uh, but to if you can place an antenna underneath the stage and it just shoots through a piece of wood, you know, let's say you've got a, a wood stage, that the wood doesn't really impact the RF substantially you might get better performance out of having an antenna closer, but with some obstruction that has a limited impact on the RF performance. So you're making some trade-offs between your you know, free, space, free space path loss and your obstructions in that Fresnel zone. Which, and this is just another example of why it's so important to try to build your system as best as possible in the beginning, because once you're on show site and deploying everything, there's compromises that are going to be made. So everything is going to have certain amount of losses to it. Um, and Gary goes into that further, um, inserting uh, filters and uh, basically anything in line with your system is probably going to incur some sort of loss. So if you're building your antenna system properly from the beginning, you're starting ahead of the curve there. Um, without, you know, having so much loss just in the beginning stages before you add anything else. Okay. Um, We've got one question kind of going back to the beginning of the presentation, part 74 license. Uh, have the requirements been loosened? Uh, I think it was probably two years ago now, but it, it re recently it became easier to apply for a part 74 license. It used to be you had to be involved more directly in TV broadcast to easily apply for a license. So you would need to be uh, a TV broadcaster, a TV producer, or something like that. Um, now, if you're a sound company that regularly operates more than 50 channels of wireless microphones, you're able to apply for a Part 74 license. Yeah, and so it, it, it has and it hasn't then, and I guess that's why I was thinking the answer was going to be closer to no, because they still haven't brought that threshold from 50 or more down at all. So you still have to maintain that threshold of 50 or more for the majority of your events. Uh, I believe that's true. Uh, how much loss would you expect to see at a receiver pack when shooting through a stage if you had your antenna underneath the stage? Yeah, a lot of these things, you know, my honest answer is try it and see. Hopefully you have some time on site to try out different antenna locations that are available to you because particularly indoors with the, you're going to have some amount of reflections and some amount of multipath that's happening uh, and different materials and how they either block or pass RF. It's tough to know for sure. That, okay. If I change it from under the stage to side stage, I'm going to see exactly 4 dB or 7 dB difference in the system. But being able to place an antenna in both of those locations and doing a walk test with each one is kind of your ultimate arbiter. Um, has part 74 been updated to cover the STL band? And uh, we had a slide uh, available spectrum. Y yes, um, you can. Well, your, your part 74 license, uh, when you apply for it, you can include STL band but it's or separate. not. Yeah. But it's so that's not a question of the part 74 license being updated. It's a question of when you apply for it, do you apply for that band and do you meet the requirements for operating in that band? Yeah, it doesn't come with its standard. That's a um, well, there, there is no standard really. Like you have to go apply for the license, you have to 
decide, do I want a site license? Do I want to get a nationwide license? Do I want to operate in, and there's some exceptions for rules in Alaska and Hawaii being different than the continental US. And there are all these different things you have to decide when you're going through the licensing process. And so um, if you're the researching it yourself, or if you've got somebody helping you with it, uh, those are some things you want to talk through uh, as, as far as the, your specific license and what you want to apply for. Um, all right. So uh, difference between active and passive antenna is a is a good question. So all these antennas that we've been talking about here are passive antennas. So they can be used as either a transmit or a receive antenna. Uh, when somebody talks about an active antenna, most often they're talking about an antenna that's going to be used for receive that would have some electronics a lot of times mounted right on the antenna. A lot of people have seen the Sure or Electro antennas that have a filter and an amplifier built right into the antenna. And in that case, once the signal comes off the antenna element, it goes immediately through a filter and then an amplifier and then sends the signal back to your receivers. And so most times that's an active antenna that you're gonna be using for receive. Um. Gary, we just got a question about where the filter belongs in the in line with your antenna. Uh, he's going to cover that here momentarily. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So filter. Uh, yeah. Sneak preview. Filter before you amplify. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then with the newer digital systems, uh, the receiver is showing amplitude or packet loss or RF strength. Uh, it depends a little bit on the system, but I will say. You know, I'm probably the most familiar with the Sure Axient digital receivers, and they actually give you two different meters on that system where you have an RF level, but then you also have a, a, a Q meter, a quality meter on there that's essentially giving you a signal to noise ratio type of reading or telling you how well the receiver is able to sort of pick the ones and zeros out of that digital stream. And so there can be cases where you have a much lower RF signal level than what you're used to because a lot of these digital systems are transmitting at maybe you know 10 milliwatts or down to one milliwatt or 20 milliwatts. If you're used to the older analog uh, FM systems that are transmitting at maybe 50 or 100 or even 250 milliwatts, your RF level can be lower, but as long as you have good signal to noise, as long as your receiver is able to figure out the you know, digital ones and zeros on the signal coming in, you can get real solid audio performance with relatively lower RF signal strength. So it's good to know which digital system you're using and then understand something like that sure quality meter and what that's telling you, because that can be a more important metric than just straight up RF signal strength. Um, does the, uh, on the, well, I guess we're going to cover uh, multi-couplers and combiners later. Um, yeah, I think uh, we're probably pretty good to move on here for a minute. Okay, um, great. And get into uh, building the rest of our system here. All right. So, yeah, let's start by talking a little bit about filters. And this is something if you've ever heard me talk about RF, I talk a lot about filtering because I think in the more complex systems that we build, one of the biggest determiners for me of solid performance, particularly in a busy RF environment, is good filtering. And so on a basic level, you want to understand what filters are in your system. Like even if you didn't have a separate external filter, where is there a filter in your system? Let's say I've just got a passive antenna with a piece of coaxial cable and I plug it into my receiver. Well, within the receiver, there's going to be a filter. And generally speaking, more expensive receivers have higher quality filters. A more expensive receiver might have what they call a tracking filter. So that's a filter that is like a bandpass filter, which you can think of sort of like a, if you're an audio guy, think of it like EQ, where it's a high pass and a low pass to make a bandpass. So bandpass filtering that centers at the frequency you care about, and then you've got some amount of roll off above and below it, where it narrows that window of the RF frequencies that are passed through the filter and, and allowed into the radio, and it helps your receiver to figure out what it cares about picking up versus things that are just interference and noise. So here's a great example of 
something that's interference and noise. Uh, our friend Jason Glass did this awesome test where he took a cell phone that was operating in the 600 meg band and he set it right next to his BB60C analyzer. And so you can see this giant uh, peak here from his cell phone. And then he took an inline filter, and this is a PWS filter that goes from 470 to 616 meg, inserted that in line with the same uh, other test parameters, and you can see how that cell phone signal gets significantly attenuated because it's outside of the filter bandwidth. But the area that you care about picking up is still passed through the filter. Uh, so as we say in the slide, this helps eliminate your unwanted signals before they get to the receiver. Uh, here's a couple examples of bandpass filters that PWS makes. Uh, the, the UHF is probably the most popular one, especially now that systems are operating in that lower part of the band. And if you want to eliminate everything above 616, uh, there's also a high band VHF filter, which can be useful if you've got VHF microphones or a VHF intercom system. These have relatively low insertion loss, and that's as we start talking about gain math, insertion loss is important. Um, these both have insertion loss around 1 dB, which is really not too bad. And given the performance increase you get from putting a filter in line with a lot of systems, this is definitely an improvement. Uh, it's worth noting that these filters are relatively wide. They're for use on systems that you know have a wide tuning range. If you know you can limit the area that you're operating in to a much narrow area, there are some other uh, filters that might be more appropriate, like a cavity tune filter that could have a, you know, maybe six meg range or just a one TV station wide range. Uh, we got any questions coming in about filters? Uh, not right now. No, nothing that's okay. uh, yep, hopped into this portion of it. All right. Uh, so then once we've put a filter in line, then the next thing we might think about doing is adding an amplifier. And so uh, here's an example of a receive line amp. And this might be used if I've got a very long run of coaxial cable between my antenna and my receiver, and I want to over overcome the loss in the coaxial cable. So let's say I've got 250 feet of cable between my antenna and my receiver, and I want to put a line amp in, I can insert a line amplifier. Uh, Again, the recommendation is to put a filter in and then a line amplifier because as it says here, there's a max input level on this line amplifier. And if I'm ex and this line amplifier has a very wide range of signals that it'll amplify. So depending on the antenna I'm using, if my antenna also has a very wide range of signals that it can pick up, it could be pretty easy to overload this amplifier. And my audio guy example that I give people is it's kind of like this idea if you took the preamp on your mixing console and turned it all the way up and then started turning your master fader up and down and say, well, why is this always distorted? That's kind of the same thing as what would happen if you had a line amplifier that was set to a very high gain setting and was overloaded. And so it's important to select the proper gain setting on your line amplifier. And it's important to filter as much as you can out of it before you go into your line amplifier to get the best performance out of your system. Obviously, we need to power this line amplifier. Uh, most of them that PWS has will be able to be powered locally if you need to, but what tends to be a lot more convenient is if we can just power it remotely. So many antenna multi-couplers and um, even re you know, receivers will have the ability to put bias power on the line, which is, I kind of explained it like it's phantom power for coaxial cable. It puts a DC voltage on the coaxial cable. Uh, if your system doesn't have uh, bias power available, you can insert it in line using this bias T. And we're showing an example of a PWS bias T. So that could be placed back at the rack, plugged into your power strip in the rack, and then send power down 250 feet of coax to your line amp and connect ultimately through your filter and to your antenna. Uh, looks like we've got a few more questions rolling in now. Sure. Um, is there gain loss with an inline filter? And that would be one dB of insertion uh, loss. It depends on the filter, right? Uh, so the, the ones that we we're showing as an example are, yeah, about when I say insertion loss, that is, yeah, it's, you're reducing the signal going through the filter. Um, some other filter types out there like saw filters have a little bit more insertion loss. Um, some of the cavity tune filters I was talking about are similar to these where there may be one or two dB worth of insertion loss. So 
as you're figuring out the total RF gain or loss in your system, it's good to think about that. What's the insertion loss of these different devices? Um, what would be the advantage of putting a filter on a high-end system such as an Axiant Digital? Uh, if you have a line amplifier somewhere in there, if, you, if you're not using a line amp and you're plugging straight into a high-end wireless mic, the only benefit you would get from a filter really is to put a narrower filter than what the front end of your wireless microphone is. And you might not know, you know, for example, like an old Sure UHFR, I think it was a 20 meg wide track tune filter on that. And so if you know that and you know that your other filter that you'd add is wider than 20 meg, you could say, well, that probably doesn't make a difference. But really what we want to think about is active electronics, active stages uh, in the signal path and making sure we're applying filtering before we put any active electronics like a receive line amp. So that would segue into this question being, uh, does putting the UHF filter in line eliminate the front end overload on the Axiom Digital Receive? It could, it depends on your total system setup, but may, it may not. Uh, so it, it really depends on what what that overload is. Now the Axiom Digital specifically like you've got that RF overload light that you see a lot more because that receiver is typically using lower transmit power levels like we talked about. And so now if you have your uh, transmitter very, very close to um, a directional antenna that's got a lot of gain or uh, even the directional antenna that also has a, an amplifier on it, like Shure's amplified antenna, I see more people and I get more questions about you know, that RF overload light and you know the answer really is like well we're expecting you to be out on stage with this thing but if you're always going to be three feet from your antenna an, an active directional antenna is probably not the right antenna for that application you may want to switch over to something like a, a simple whip like a dipole antenna um, can I use a filter in an in-ear monitor system well you would have to figure out a way to place the filter between the antenna and the input to the body pack. So it's certainly possible, although I don't know of any commercially available systems that would be easy to do that with. So, yeah, it's an interesting uh, idea. Is the maximum cable length for coax antenna cable 150 feet? Uh, the, the maximum cable length is how much loss you can deal with in your particular system and what kind of coaxial cable you're using. So, I mean, like with so many things, the answer is it depends. I mean, if you're looking for a, a rule of thumb, like I will say that in the systems I set up, even if I'm using pretty large low loss cable, if I get over 300 feet, I'm definitely thinking about maybe going to an RF over fiber system. Um, less than that. I'm going to dig into some more of the system specifics, and we'll talk a little bit about this with RF over fiber, but it's important to you know remember that these things, even though the cost is going down, RF over fiber is still relatively more expensive than running long lengths of large coax, and so you may have a, a cost to consider there also. Um, all right, we got a few more here before we move forward into... Uh the fiber realm of our conversation here. Sure. Um, so, did it go? Uh, aren't our are line amps always on full amplification and then you just attenuate them? Uh, most line amplifiers have a fixed gain to them. There's, you know, you, there are fixed and variable gain RF amps, but most of the line amplifiers that we use will have a fixed gain to them and then for example, this uh, PWS receive line amplifier where you have a gain selection of 5 or 15 dB, it's essentially a 15 dB amp with a 10 dB pad that switches in line. Um, can you combine filters? Sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, all, all the time. Like, I'll, I'll take a high pass and a low pass and plug them into each other to make an appropriate band pass filter. Um, there are some sort of unique applications where you could, let's say, take two separate bandpass filters with a pair of passive splitter combiners and 
make uh, a filter that's got two different band passes to it, but obviously those splitter combiners are each going to have some on a loss, and so you have to account for that in your RF gain structure. But yeah, you can definitely stack filters. Just make sure you're filtering in an, into an appropriate range. Um, could it be possible to put filters between an antenna and an AXT 600 or a spectrum manager? You could, yeah. And in, in some cases, if you're using that AXT 600 uh, is your is your scanner, there's times when you'd want that to be able to see a wider part of the RF spectrum than what your receivers are set to. And so it may not be the best place to put a filter, but you definitely could. And again, just understand that you may be filtering out some of the band that your AXT 600 would normally be scanning for you. Um, would RF overload be worse on a digital system than an analog system, considering the QAM modulation in digital systems? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if overload is ever better or worse. I mean, we really just, we try to avoid overload, right? Like we wanna, we wanna maintain our proper RF gain structure. Um, all right, two more quick ones here. Should your antenna cable always be of equal lengths on a diversity system? They don't have to be the same length. And can I remote a whip dipole antenna in the middle of a stage, like in front of the kick drum? So I think they're trying yeah, to look for like a... You want to know what kind of whip antenna you have. If your whip antenna is actually a dipole that has both elements to it, then that could be remote mounted. Um, back in the old days, you used to see a lot more of these ground plane omni antennas where you would see the driven element and then you would also see these little sort of like Sputnik looking ground plane elements coming off at an angle from the bottom of the antenna. Um, so it depends on specifically on your antenna, but the sure antenna that we showed back here uh, is an example of a dipole antenna that can be mounted on a stand. Uh, because it doesn't rely on something else as its ground plane. In some cases, in a less expensive wireless system, if you have just a simple quarter wave whip antenna, it's relying on the chassis of the receiver as its ground plane. And in that case, if you were to remote it, uh, you're removing the ground plane and you're you know, causing that antenna to perform really poorly without it. I just wanted to expand on your answer to the uh, should your antenna cable always be equal lengths on diversity. If a single antenna input is being fed by two different receive antennas or two different transmit antennas that happen to be where I've seen it used is like two antennas that are used right next to each other to change the polar pattern of the receiving, the length of the antenna cable between the antenna and the passive combiner should all be as, should be the same length as close as you can get. More important even for transmit antennas because you'll be transmitting two different things. In one case I used it, I had a, 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 a Sennheiser dome shooting the main stage and right behind it, a, a paddle shooting away because okay. the performer walked to the back of that and I actually padded the paddle down a little tiny bit, but I made the length of the cable connecting the two of them together as close as, as possible to the same. Yep, yeah, exactly right. So I should, yeah, yeah I should say that um, I was thinking about a diversity receive setup where if I have my A and B side receive, those two lengths don't need to be the same. But yeah, to your point, Pete, if you're going into a passive splitter, a passive combiner, and maybe a, let's, in your, your example is multi-zone transmit, right? Like in that case, there's a lot more consideration of how are these two antennas going to interact? Are they in separate RF spaces? Are they in the same RF spaces? They're in the same RF space. Yeah. It's really important to be the same exact length. Different RF spaces, it really doesn't matter. Right, right. Yep. All right. Um, are there selectable filters available? And are there any tunable filters that contain both low pass and high pass? Sure. I mean, there's a whole other world of uh, RF components out there that audio guys don't necessarily start digging into. But, you know, companies like Microwave Filter Company, uh, RF Lambda, you know, there's uh, there's even mini circuits 
And these guys make all sorts of different high pass, low pass, band pass filters. Um, one that I tend to use commonly is from Microwave Filter Company. They make a cavity tune filter that's a band pass filter that's tunable across the entire UHF TV band. Uh, you need some specialized equipment to tune it, but if you have that equipment, yeah, there's all there's all sorts of different filter options out there. Great. Um, well, if you're ready, uh, I think we can hop into cable now. And uh, sure. there is one question in the gate uh, about cable after you're done with that. All right. Um, yeah, so we talked briefly about splitting and combining. Uh, there are active and passive ways to do it. Uh, this is an example of some passive splitter combiners, and these since they're passive devices, they could be used either way. So like this first PWS S5624 is just a two-way splitter or a two-way combiner. So you could use this to take a single IAM transmit and send it to two antennas like Pete was just talking about, or you could use it to take two antennas in two different zones perhaps and combine them together to go into an A side receive in your system. And so these are good little sort of RF Legos to you know, building blocks of, of different types of systems. Um, the ones that PWS makes internally, there's a circuit board on there that just has a Wilkinson strip line uh, splitter combiner. There are other topologies that you can get for these splitter combiners from other vendors. Uh, this gives you just an example of some of the specs for these devices. Um, important thing to think about is the power handling, particularly if you're using them on, a, on the transmit side, and think about each one of your carriers going into a combiner is going to contribute to the overall power that the combiner has to be able to handle. Uh, we talked a bit before about insertion loss here, but same thing. I mean, these are power you know, dividers in, in a lot of cases. and so. When you're taking that power uh, IM transmit again, if you're dividing it into two different zones, as you split that, you're going to see three and a half dB of loss. And remember, three dB is half power, right? Uh, so I think that's also a reason why you tend to see active devices when you get above, let's say, four-way uh, combining, because you're going to need some additional gain in there. So an active combiner is going to have amplifiers that help to overcome the loss through the combining system or the loss in a splitting system in the case of a multi-coupler for receive. Okay, and coax. So we did talk about coax and you know, without getting into the many, many different types of coax out there, we just wanted to get some basic rules of thumb that your smaller coax is generally higher loss, and larger coax is generally lower loss. And so when we say smaller, larger, we're talking about the outside diameter of the cable. And so uh, these small patch cables that you use within a rack, uh, like RG58 is a common type of uh, 50 ohm coax that's used for patch cables. If you look at the loss here at 100 feet, you're over 12 dB, where if you go up to a uh, better cable like an RG8X or even an LMR240, slightly larger cable, a little bit less loss, but then if you step up to RG8U, um, the PWS9046, uh, LMR400 size, these are much larger cables and you have a loss that is, you know, in this case, less than half of what an RG58 cable will do. And so if I can do it, I'll try to use larger cable and avoid adding a bunch of amplifiers to my system. Like if I can do a directional antenna, passive antenna, low loss cable back to my rack, I will. That seems to be, you know, your kind of best case scenario for good performance. Uh, Cody, you mentioned there was a question about uh, coax cable. Uh, yeah, uh, someone was just asking uh, to speak on specific types. Uh, the three that were given were uh, GZL 5000, Ecoflex 10, and LMR 400. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with the GZL cable. I know uh, LMR 400 and Ecoflex 10. Uh, when you talk about LMR 400, you want to make sure to d make a distinction between LMR 400 and LMR 400 UF. Uh, the standard LMR400 cable has a solid center conductor, and I think it's like a 10-gauge center conductor, so it's very stiff, and it's not great for things other than maybe fixed installations. Um, but LMR400UF and Echoflex 10 are very similar. 
Uh, they're both similar size cables and they have similar size stranded center conductors. And so really at that point, you just get into discussions about which one is more roadworthy, easier to coil, uncoil, um, doesn't break down as much over time. Great. Uh, I think that was it as far as uh, cable goes for now. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, GZL uh, is Sennheiser. It's their Ecoflex offering from uh, Henry Cohen. Oh, it's a Sennheiser part number for a large, like low loss cable. All right. Cool. All right. Well, let's start talking about why everybody's here. Um, RF over fiber. So as we've mentioned a couple of times, like why do you use RF over fiber? Well, because you need to run a long distance. And so you can run signals a long distance over fiber optic cable with very little loss. And this is true of computer network, fiber optic cable, and the fiber optic cable that we're using in wireless systems. So what you end up with in a RF over fiber system is typically some sort of electronics, a little box on each end, that will convert from an electrical signal to an optical signal. So you've got some, in the case of a receive antenna, very, very, very low level electrical signal that's coming off of that receive antenna. And so you need to take that signal and then turn it, that varying electrical voltage from that signal into a varying intensity of light most times. So uh, one thing that's when I talk about RF over fiber with people, I try to explain them like a lot of folks conceptually think about fiber optic in terms of computer networks where the light is on or off because you're sending ones or zeros. Uh, that's typically not the case in RF over fiber. Most of the systems that we use for RF over fiber are analog, meaning that this varying voltage converts it to a varying intensity of light. So the light gets brighter and dimmer, kind of analogous to how the electrical voltage rises and falls. So you've got then a laser diode that will send this brighter and dimmer light over a fiber optic cable. Um, most systems right now seem to be single mode fiber or designed for single mode fiber. Reason being that we don't have a big cost difference between single mode and multi-mode like we had years ago. So since single mode components are relatively inexpensive, you might as well go with that because single mode gives you lower, um, lower loss than multi-mode uh, over longer distances. So for folks who have never uh, used fiber optic cabling before, it's good to start out with some common connector types. And so I've just got a link in here you can go look at uh, to get familiar with these different connector types that you've probably seen. Um, ST is still what I see most commonly. SC is also common, and that's the two we have pictured here. The ST is the middle picture. It looks uh, sort of like a BNC connector, but for fiber optic, the SC is the one that's kind of a square plastic looking thing. Uh, and then at the ends of those pieces of fiber, when the fiber is terminated into the connector, they polish the end of the connector and there's different ways they can polish it. Um, and that's also important because um, there are some RF over fiber systems out there that choose to use an angled polish to it. And you wanna make sure you understand if you have an angle polish or a flat polish to your fiber optic cable because you it's it's important that they mate together flat either flat to flat or angle to angle and so uh, we're showing this green connector on the end here and that green plastic is the, usually an indication that you have an angle polish connector on it so uh, there's also adapter cables that can adapt between the different types of fiber optic cable also with the different polishes so let's say you've got a rack mount device that needs an apc connector but you want to convert to st for a back panel bulkhead connection you can do that uh, so then you put your signal on the fiber you go through as clean an optical path as you can um, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're going to be talking about today but if you start working a lot with fiber you're probably going to want to think about learning how to clean fiber optic connections or hopefully you have a fiber tech available who can check and clean your different uh, fiber connections if you're especially if you're going through a lot of different hops if you're going through building fiber or something like that it's important to maintain the cleanliness of your connectors to get the good signal from end to end uh, so when you get to the other end you're gonna have a photodiode that converts your optical signal back into electrical and 
as we'll get into a little bit more with the diagrams coming up, uh, gain structure here becomes really the name of the game. Like it's critical to have proper gain structure through all of your different uh, stages and, and, and conversions that happen. So what do we got coming in so far? Sorry about that. Uh, Pete is setting up <laughs> for their demo here. Okay. Um, let's see. It's, uh, it's, uh, RFO fiber is an analog signal. The cleanliness of your fiber is way more important than even digital. I mean, it's it, it, it's... It basically, if you've got a dirty connector, it's like putting a pad in your RF line. Yeah, exactly right. The signal. And there are a bunch of these devices out. This is made by JDSU, uh, allows you to plug in your thing and also has a probe to uh, probe in holes and, and, and actually look at at 400 times uh, the, the fiber so you can see if it's clean. Now this, I don't know whether you can tell by this, it's, it's not very clean, all kinds of dirt in there. So that's really, really important. Even if you don't have an analy a, a, a microscope to look at it, always clean your RF over fiber with something, even if you can't look at it. Assume yeah. it's dirty when it comes from the shop. Yeah, a lot of the times when we connect these systems up, especially if it's, let's say, patching, passing through a truck, TV truck patch bay or something like that, and, and you've got a uh, you know technician that says, oh, we're not getting any signal from end to end. It's like, well, have you cleaned the fiber? Oh, sure we did. Oh, can you go clean it again? And then, oh, it works great. Uh, so that runs into a question here on how to clean connectors. Sure, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of different options, something as simple as there's wipes that are made specifically for cleaning fiber optic cable. There are these little um, spring-loaded kind of push connectors that can clean fiber optic cable. It's gonna vary a little bit by the type of connector that you have. Uh, Pete's showing you one of the little push connectors there that you just you take that cap off and you place it against your fiber and you just push on it and it cleans the end so yeah and these are all things that are you'll become familiar with if you start doing a lot of particularly portable applications of rf over fiber because that's just every day when you're setting up tearing down you just get used to checking it out with your scope and cleaning it and also i find it's handy to have um some sort of a like uh, what did you say that a light source of a specified level and then a meter that can read that level so you can figure out your loss through multiple cable uh, and multiple patches and see if that level just across the optical cable is within an acceptable range um got a quick one here before we move on um when should one use rf over fiber instead of low loss antenna cable yeah, when you have to go a really long way and when you can afford it. And, you know, it's really, um, like I was saying before, if you're, you know, generally speaking, I mean, it can be, it can vary with system, but I would say generally speaking, if you're less than 300 feet away, it's almost always cheaper and easier to run coax. Uh, but let's say I've got a situation where I'm doing a TV broadcast and they want to do uh, stand up out in the lobby before the show starts and my antenna system set up for the stage, but they want it to be on the same system. You know, you might be able to put RF over fiber out there because usually they're running a camera out there and so they're going to need to run fiber anyway to get the video signal back, right? So find out, are they pulling a TAC-12? Can I use a couple of strands of that fiber to get uh, antenna placed out in that area? Same thing could go for, you know, you're on a red carpet someplace or you're way back in a back hallway of an arena that doesn't that's you know that's well shielded from your stage area and any place where you need to have you know additional zones of coverage that are at some distance away and sometimes if they're already running fiber there it can be much more convenient to just put these devices on either end of the fiber than it is to run your own coax for five six hundred feet great and then we just had a uh, a comment on here uh single mode has more reliable internal refraction parameters which are needed for rf over fiber that so is true i would elaborate further on that yep um there's one more in here but we'll uh it's uh quite the rabbit hole so we'll go down <laughs> that one uh in a minute here all right 
So this is the RF over fiber system that PWS sells. Uh, it is called the PRISM, P-R-Z-M. And this is just a set of two different boxes. There's a transmit box and receive box. Uh, if you were doing diversity antennas, you would need two pair, or, you know, two sets to do diversity antennas. And so, uh, like we were talking about before, we tend to always filter before we go into any active electronics. And obviously, a uh, RF over fiber transmitter has got a lot of active electronics in it. So, the standard filter range on this is 470 to 616 meg, but we have other available ranges. Uh, we can also pull the filter out entirely and let the system run wideband, but in that case, we strongly, strongly recommend that you in install an external filter. But that can be helpful if, you know, let's say you're using the system in one of these alternate frequency bands we talked about before. Uh, you might need something that, you know, does two gig. Who knows? Uh, single mode uh, ST connection on this. Uh, so BNC for the RF connection. And then your somewhat industry standard XLR four pin mail connection for DC power. So you can plug a power supply into it. Uh, there's also a uh, Anton Bauer Gold or V-mount battery shoe available for it. So it's particularly on the remote end of it, having it be able to be battery powered uh, can be an advantage. There's a threaded mount on there. And really there's not much for external controls because there's a little software utility that comes with it. And so to set this up, you do need a laptop, but you would take a USB cable and plug your laptop into the transmitter receive box and then set it up from there. And the software will show you a meter and it'll show you, uh, in the case of the transmit end, you have a low noise amplifier that you have the ability to turn on and off. Uh, it's a 30 dB LNA. And then you've also got a 30 dB pad that you can turn on. So if you need to pad the signal down, which can be very useful in the case of IEM transmit application, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So here's a basic signal flow. If I wanted to set up a system that just had two, um, let's, let's see, is that right? I think I did that wrong. I did do that wrong. Oh no. All right. Let's. All right. Well, this is going to be a problem. Okay. Uh, this says I am transmit, but the idea with this slide was going to be for receive. So let's assume we're plugging this back into a receiver and everything else uh, looks right. And then I can fix this slide later. But. Um, the idea here is that you've got just two antennas and two antennas could plug into a transmit box and then get back to your receiver. It's pretty straightforward. All you need to do is adjust the LNA and the pad on either end. I like to set them up both like at my table before I deploy the remote end, just to have both of these boxes set up, have a patched cable connected between the two of them, and then have just a whip antenna plugged in to the one box just to kind of make sure that I've got everything flowing through the system and that I'm seeing the, you know, I'll even plug in my analyzer to the receive end rather than plugging it into my mic receive to start with. So you're just sort of testing only the RF over fiber link first to make sure that the boxes are configured right. So then when you go and deploy that into a larger system, if you have to start troubleshooting, you know, start troubleshooting your fiber optic cable or troubleshoot your antenna connection before you start thinking about are the settings within the box accurate. So let's see. Yeah, this one's right here, so that's good. Um, what, we got questions coming in so far? Yeah, we got uh, just a couple here. Um, so um, Jason Glass has asked, what is the polish type on PRISM? So PRISM is a UPC end on the ST connector. And we have one more um, from Ike. Uh, does the PRISM receive provide 12 volt bias for antennas and external amplifiers? It does not. So yeah, you'd need to use a bias T if you're gonna put a uh, line amp in there. Hopefully you're able to get the PRISM box close enough to your antenna that you really don't need a line amp, but I could see maybe there would be some applications where 
that would be necessary, and then you need to put in a bias T. Great. I think we're good for now. Okay. So sorry about this being transmit instead of receive, but uh, this next one was a transmit, and this is a two-zone transmit application, which I think is pretty common if you're doing transmit. Now, I'll start by saying that transmit over fiber is sort of an order of magnitude more complicated than receive over fiber because you have to think about it per carrier. You know, our strong recommendation is that you don't run multiple carriers over uh, a piece of fiber in a transmit application, and you'll see why in a second here. So this would be some uh, situation where you've got two zones of transmit. So let's say I need to transmit to the stage, and then maybe I need to cover out somewhere at front of house if you've got, you know, you're one of these large festivals where there's a thrust that goes all the way out to your front of house position and you've got an artist out at front of house, they want their ears to work out there. So it's typical to use a directional coupler, which uh, PWS doesn't currently make a directional coupler, but there's a lot of good folks like mini circuits that do. The idea with the directional coupler is that you'll have an input and then one output that's relatively low. Um, loss so let's say half a db or one db worth of loss through it and that would go to your primary antenna in this case the zone one antenna and then you've got a, a coupled output which intentionally has maybe 20 to 30 db worth of loss to it and the reason we're doing that is because in most of these rf over fiber systems the pws one included they really don't want to see more than maybe one milliwatt at the input which is zero dbm and so you need to knock that signal down anyway. So going through a directional coupler gives you that very easily. And then once you get to the transmit side, you've got that additional pad that you can engage through the software to tune in that signal to exactly the level that you need to hit the transmitter. And I think Pete's showing you an example of a directional coupler that's got, what, a 12 dB uh, tapped it's out? Minus two on the direct out, in to out, minus two and minus 12 on the split. This is a, a coupler that was recommended to me by Henry Cohen okay. uh, to, to do basically exactly this drawing right here. Yep. Pull off a feed to go to my uh, RF over fiber. And generally, I'd, this would have to be padded even more depending on how many carriers I had in there. Right, right, yeah, and that's why, like in this case, that T1's got a 30 dB pad in it if you need more pad to it but the, the big advantage of doing it this way is that you're not um, introducing as much loss to your primary antenna as you would otherwise with just a standard uh two by one splitter yeah only two db for for the main yep. antenna. yeah so then once we hit the transmit box and we set our level appropriately it's going to send the signal down the fiber we're going to come out on the other side and then here's the big thing is you need to have some sort of amplifier once you come off of the receive box. So this TX amp is the reason that you don't really want to do multiple carriers because you'll very easily get a lot of intermod through that transmit amplifier as you start running multiple carriers through it. So it's far, far better to do just like, hey, this is my mix one IM and this will work in a larger area and mix two, three, and four, those still just work up on the stage. So then your zone two antenna, uh, you're going to select an appropriate amplifier level so that it covers zone two without significant overlap into zone one. Because again, your receiver doesn't really want to see a signal from both of these antennas at the same time. It wants to see either zone one or zone two. And ideally, you're able to tailor that overlap to an area where you're not going to use the receiver. All right. Uh, here's a slightly more sophisticated version of the same thing. This is where they say, no, no, we have to have two mixes out in our remote zone. So now you just sort of scale everything up. You put two directional couplers in line into two separate transmit boxes. You use two strands of fiber and you go to two different receivers with two separate amplifiers on the other end. You could certainly use a uh, passive combiner coming off of those two TX amps if you only wanted to put one transmit antenna into zone two. But uh, then if you look down on the bottom, you've got zone one. Now that I've got multiple signals, those directional couplers are actually gonna feed into some sort of a transmit combiner. Like this is a PWS UX8, and that feeds your main zone of antenna transmit. All 
All right. Cody, what do we got for RF over fiber questions? Um, right now, we have pretty much gotten to most of them. Uh, you've answered a few of them. Uh, RF over fiber be used for in your monitors, which we just covered. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, lots of fiber safety tips uh, using the dust caps and making sure you're protecting the connectors. Clean, clean uh, fiber is your friend. Clean fiber is your friend always. Um, and that's about it where we've got right now. So obviously you're explaining yeah. things very well. Oh, well, I hope. All right. So we're going to touch a little bit on multi-zone systems. And we already talked a little bit with this uh, IEM application about multiple zones where we're trying to separate our two different zones so that you're either in zone A or zone B and you're not in this overlap area because that's usually where things get a little a little wonky, a little, a little bit of, a bit of uh, not optimal in there. So uh, this is a really cool graphic from our friend Jason Glass who drew the antenna patterns overlapping with each other. And so he's got kind of an imaginary box here. And let's just say this is the same as our IAM application where we've got, uh, well, not IAM application. But let's say this is a microphone application where we're at stage and front of house. So if you imagine the left side of this box being your stage and then the right side of this box being your front of house. You could see an AB antenna at your stage and then an AB antenna out at front of house. Well, if you just connected up your antennas, and in this case, we're just assuming that, let's say we're going through a RF over fiber system and so your gain through your system is relatively the same. If you had identical uh, receives, a, B stage, A, B front of house, you can see there's a large amount of overlap between the coverage of these four different antennas. Um, we're doing a lot of smart things here, like we're putting the two A antennas as far apart from each other as we can. We're putting the two B antennas pretty far apart. We're maybe not aiming them directly at each other if we can get away with that. But still, we've got this huge area here in the center that's overlap, and that's not going to be optimal for our uh, multi-zone receive. So what we want to do is we want to minimize that and we say, well, look, out here at front of house, like I don't need this giant coverage area that goes really far outside of this box. So why don't we just turn it down, All right? So we just put a 3 dB pad in line and relatively speaking, you can see what that does. It reduces your coverage area, but it doesn't matter because you're reducing it in an area that you don't care about. And it, but what it does is it pushes your overlap into maybe seating area or someplace you don't care about. And it also makes that small. And if I could get away with it here, I might try going to 6 dB worth of pad and see if that, if it still gives me enough coverage out at front of house, but really separates the second zone from this first zone. So that's something I like to talk with people about when you're when you're doing these sorts of things with multi-zone systems. You really want to think about them as separate RF zones and see what you can do to tailor your coverage so that there the overlap happens in areas you don't care about and that's not always possible but you know try to do that as much as as you're able to and if you have a lot of fancy test equipment to test this great but a lot of times literally taking a microphone setting it to transmit and go and walk your two different zones you know plug in zone a walk it plug in zone b walk it plug the two together walk it like you can figure it out with the tools at hand in many many uh, circumstances um, before we dive deeper into uh, our uh, standard multi-zone coverage here, uh, a couple things have come up for fiber now. Sure. Um, the one uh, I was talking about a little bit ago uh, has repeated a couple times. So it's a, almost a combination here. So what are the best practices for gain structure over fiber? And that's kind of the same thing, which are what are your most common mistakes when using RS over RF over fiber? Sure. Yeah. So it is a little bit system specific as to what different uh, gain adjustments you have available to you. Um, but, you know, speaking about the PRISM system, and I think this applies pretty generally, um, you first want to not overload the input of the transmit box. So you absolutely have to keep it below one milliwatt. If you're plugging a receive antenna into it, that's almost never going to be a problem unless you have crazy strong signals coming into that receive antenna location. 
Um, but in an IM situation, it's a very, very big deal. So if you're using it for a transmit application, you really have to make sure that you're not overloading the input to the transmit box. Uh, as I mentioned with the PRISM system, you've got the metering and the software, and you've also got both a switchable low noise amp and a adjustable pad that can help you to get that gain uh, in the range that it's supposed to be. And then at that point, it puts the signal onto the fiber. We've talked about just keeping your fiber as clean as possible because you want to get as much of that signal over to the receive side. And then same thing on the receive side, like you're, you know, in a perfect world, this is a unity gain system, meaning whatever signal I put in on the transmit end is exactly the signal that comes out on the receive end. So I'm passing it through this RF over fiber system without changing it, right? So we do give you a pad on the receive end if you need to pad it down a little bit to go into your receive system. But more often than not, you're going to come off the receive side and you're just going to go into either an antenna multi-coupler that's hopefully also unity gain or in this transmit application that we're showing here, you're going to go into a transmit amplifier because you're going to try and bring that signal that's maybe at, you know, less than a milliwatt up to, you know, 50 milliwatts or so to go into a transmit antenna. Maybe even a quarter watt in some applications, just depends on what you're doing. Um, quick one that refers to earlier on in uh, this webinar, um, does PWS make an RF filter that passes voltage for a sure powered antenna? You know, I should know that, but I'm not sure. I don't think our filters will pass bias power. I'm pretty sure they, no. Let's say I'm 90% sure they don't pass. I don't believe they do. Bias power, yeah. And that, uh, but if you're, yeah, if you're using an active antenna, the Sure active antenna or like Electrosonics active antenna is going to have a filter before the amp in that active antenna. So there's not a whole lot of situations where you would also need to put in an inline filter. Um, but actually, hang on. Oh, I'm getting some info that the inline filters do pass DC. <laughs> All but, right. Uh, it's still, still true that I don't know that you would necessarily need that uh, very often. So that would show how many times we've done that and needed to do that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here's a pretty good one, um, which is sort of a rabbit hole, but I think we can provide some light on this uh, fairly quickly. Um, how do you predict coverage areas in your multi-zone, multi-antenna situations, and is there a best practice for this? Well, uh, are they talking about how do you predict coverage, just where your antenna is going to cover, or where your antenna is going to cover once you start turning down the gain in a multi-zone system where they're not as separate as we'd like them to be? And I think the question here is going to be uh, more tailored to how do I know uh, when my coverage areas are overlapping and how do I know how to uh, attenuate them and how much? Right. Yeah, so let's say I'm setting up a two-zone system for wireless mic receive. Uh, what I tend to do is, you know, in a lot of my situations, I don't have a lot of choice over where the antennas get to go. I mean, I've got some latitude, but it's like generally has to go on the stage, generally has to go in front of house in this example that we were using before. So I'll place those antennas in what seems to me like the optimal spot in those two locations, and then I'll just connect the uh, zone one, and I'll go walk it and see what my coverage area is. Um, and then I'll just connect zone two and I'll go walk it and see what my coverage area is, see when I start to get at the edge of coverage and when it starts to drop out. And so that'll give me a really good idea of where the overlap's happening. It's just by connecting zone one only and then zone two only uh, and seeing where I can pick up the signal from. And, and ideally you've got a, either someone who's helping you can watch some meters or you've got software hooked up to your receivers that can do one of these walk test functions like, I think a lot of people have probably used the timeline function on Sure Wireless Workbench, which is good for this. So just figuring out where you are in terms of, and where your power levels are, because really you, you know, you want to be, I don't know, let's say 12 dB down from your main zone before you even think about picking up, you know, decent on your, on your second zone. 
Um, if you can be completely separate, that's ideal. But a lot of times, I know a lot of these systems, there's a lot of overlap to them. And so we're just going to start dialing in attenuation until we've got coverage in an area that we need, but have minimized that overlap. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, a huge question that is not easily uh, answered. So I think you covered that pretty well. Um, as far as uh, your prior drawing that had the uh, multi-zone prism mm -hmm. system in it, um, what kind of transmit amplifier would you recommend? Um, I think we tend to use amplifiers from mini circuits depending on the application, but there's an, uh, well, there's several uh, different companies out there that make good RF amps. Um, and then uh, another, which end would I place an amplifier, antenna, or retriever receiver transmitter end? Which end would I place an amplifier, antenna, or receiver transmitter end? No, I think he's saying, which end would I place an amplifier, antenna, or receiver transmitter end? Uh, okay, so in, oh, in this case, prism? yeah, the, if with the prism system, your you know your transmit side is RF in, optical out, and your receive side is optical in, RF out, right? So. Uh, if you're talking about setting up a remote zone of receive antennas, your transmit side is at the far end with your antennas and your receive sides at the rack to feed into your mic receivers. If you're talking about this, which is an IEM application, you just swap that. So in fact, that's what was wrong with this first slide that we did is we just had the, uh, receive and transmit swapped and I need to get that slide fixed. But, uh, in a, IM application, you come out of your IM transmitter, you go into the transmit box, and then your receive box is at the far end with your amplifier going into the transmit antenna. I think what you have to remember is when you're doing a transmit over fiber, you've already lowered your RF signal down to zero dB to get go into your unit. So you don't overload the, the uh, fiber. So yep. you're going to get about zero dB out, which is at least 10 dB less than you want to be transmitting. Right. So you've got to amplify it at the end. Amplifying it at the beginning would just blow up your RF over fiber box. Oh, yeah. If you're asking about where do I put the Which amplifier is. in an IEM application, absolutely. Right. Like it's got to be on the, you know, the far side just before you go to the antenna. Yep. Um, and I think last one we've got in the gate here is, uh, do you recommend multi-zone over high transmit power? Uh, yeah, that's uh, another one of those total it depends sort of things. Like you may have a microphone that can, you know, switch from 10 milliwatts to 50 milliwatts, or you may not, or you may be in a situation where you're using a high density mode and everything's set to one milliwatt. And so, it may be necessary to put in a multi-zone system because you don't have a lot of control over transmit power. And kind of the same thing, like your your walk test is kind of the ultimate decider of, you know, can I cover this with my normal antenna system or do I need to add another zone of, of antennas? I think it's careful. You have to, adding multi-zone receive is less problematic than multi-zone transmit because if right. you have multi-zone transmit, that, sh that share the same RF space, that are aiming to the same place, your signal will dip down and be very erratic. So you don't want to have more than one transmit antenna pointing at a particular receive place. However, you yeah. could have a transmit antenna off in, off in the, it's over there, off in the dressing rooms. So right. that your, your monitor could be tested or your mics could be tested, but they're not in the same area as your theater. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. All right. Well, you want to talk about uh, a multi-zone uh, antenna distribution box? Yeah, looks like we've got uh, about 15 minutes or so here. So I think we can cool. uh, cruise through this. So if you want to do multi-zone antennas, here's one way to do it. This is 
PWS's entry level box. It's a what they call the Alpha Series multi zone uh, distribution. This has got four pairs of inputs, so uh, antenna A and B, one through four. Those come into the box, they get passively combined together, filtered, amplified, and then sent out to eight A side outputs and eight B side outputs. So you can have you know, your eight receivers connected to this that then all those receivers will see up to four separate zones of antennas. Uh, this is the again the kind of the simplest version of this. So if you need to have uh, over, zones that are overlapped a bit, you might end up putting external pads on the inputs here. Uh, but this will give you four zones of receive, and there's a lovely diagram of how that works. So you've just got your eight antennas out there and your four zones, and you can feed. A lot of receivers with it and this is pretty common i mean like uh, the last one i did with one of these exact boxes last install i did with it was a tv studio where they had you know three separate studios and a weather desk outside and they just wanted to connect all of these to a common rack of uh, microphone receivers and then their talent could go anywhere in the whichever studio or out to the weather desk and they wouldn't have to worry about switching to different uh, transmitters on the talent uh, a little sneak preview, since there's no NAB happening this spring, uh, something that was going to be announced at NAB is the Omega series of receive, combine, and distribution. So this is kind of a one step up from that alpha multi-zone system. Similar in that it's still four separate zone inputs, uh, still one RU, uh, but this one gives you a couple of extra bells and whistles on it so you can turn bias power on and off for each uh, zone and you can actually for each input, that's right, and then you can uh, adjust your pad level. So this is if you're doing the sort of portable shows that we do where, you know, we might be a different uh, setup each week, having that rotary pad on there that can give you zero to minus 40 is pretty handy. Uh, so this is going to be coming out soon from PWS. Uh, another thing we like to talk about a little bit with multi-zone, if you're using Axiom Digital, Quadversity is something that you might have heard people talk about. And Quadversity is kind of cool where you actually take your cascade ports on an Axiom receiver and turn them into a C and D antenna input. So now that you don't have cascade ports, obviously you need some sort of a multi-coupler in the rack. So this 4x4 quad distro is a box designed for that type of an application where you can actually plug in, I'll show you on the next page here, you can plug four separate antennas into the quad distro and then each one of those A, B, C, D outputs has four outs so you can feed your four receivers. And if you need more than four receivers for this, there's also a 2RU version of this that could feed eight receivers. And so this is pretty cool as well because you've got really separate antenna inputs to the receiver so now you don't need to worry as much about the overlapping zones and different rf spaces like you can really have all four of these antennas wherever you want that to get the coverage that you need uh, you want to maintain diversity obviously but I've, I've talked to a lot of people who will end up saying okay well yeah i'll put my a and b on stage and then c and d can be my zone too and i don't have to worry about overlap at all Remember that Axion Digital is a totally different kind of diversity. Those four antennas are all receiving all the time and the computer is deciding, oh, I like bits from here, bits from here, bits from here, bits from here, and sticking them all together into a good signal. So really all four of them are running at the same time and giving you the best quality sum of the digital signal. Yeah, and I think Henry pointed out before that that quality meter is really looking at that bit error rate uh, between the different inputs. And if it gets four inputs, it can really just you know do a, a better, even better job of figuring out where the best signal is coming from at any point in time. When they uh, when they demoed the Axiom to me, if you don't mind me telling the story, uh, it, they walked down the block and it was all fine. They turned the block and went five city blocks south out of line of sight where the RF had totally gone away and the QoS or the bit error rate started going down. They got five blocks away before the Axiom Digital dropped out. It was quite amazing. 
yeah, that was definitely the biggest like thing for me to get used to was having a low RF level, but still having enough uh, signal there that the receiver can figure out all the ones and zeros. It's, it's pretty impressive if you're used to an old analog FM system. Uh, okay, uh, we've got other questions rolling in, Cody, you wanna talk a bit about transmit? Um, well, we can uh, divert back to fiber a little bit, or we can try to knock out this um, uh, multi-zone transmit here that we have next. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go through this real briefly. Um, okay. This is something that we get asked for enough that it seems like it's worth putting together a slide. You folks are probably familiar with the four input and eight input transmit combiners that PWS makes. Um, and this is your kind of standard issue eight combine for IEM application. But uh, we've had some folks ask, well, yeah, I want to do multiple zones, but I really don't like the loss when I go through the passive combiner. Uh, if I were to take this, or passive splitter in this case, if I were to take this output and split it to go to two different zones, I'm going to lose half my power at least. You know, I'm going to lose, what did we say before, three and a half dB. So is there any way around that? Well, sure, it's fancy and expensive and complicated, but absolutely there's a way around it. So we made this box that will take each one of your outputs from your IEMs and it just splits it. And then after you split it, you go into the combiner for each zone. You have a separate combiner for each zone. And since these combiners have an auto gain control, it just gains everything back up and now you get two full power outputs. So the idea is you have a uh, combiner for each zone and each zone gets the maximum output power from the combiner to feed each zone. And so that box is a P-812S. All right. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's see what else we got for questions. Is that box passive? It is, yeah. It's just a bunch of one in, two out, you know, passive splitters. So it really makes it easier than putting eight of those little one by two boxes gaff taped in your rack. Um, All righty, so since DC uh, doesn't go over fiber, does that mean that you must have AC or DC at the remote location? Absolutely, yeah, we were talking about back here, I think. Um, so there's a DC input for each one of these boxes. And then if you do have trouble getting actual, you know, AC power to the far end, that's where you'd think about putting that uh, battery shoe on there, either Anton Bauer Gold or a V-mount battery, because that battery could power your remote end, uh, depending on the size of the battery for, you know, the whole day, possibly. Um. So since we're talking about power, um, are there any challenges with bias power on receiver units when adding to an antenna distro, I'm assuming with Axiant Digital? Um, I know the Axiant does provide bias power. Um, we talked about, you know, some of the PWS multi-couplers provide bias power. So, and if you don't have bias power, available on the you know where you're connecting to you can always put a bias t in line and you can add that bias power to the line just kind of with an inline adapter so you should be able to figure out a way to get bias power on the line one way or the other right yeah um one thing uh that uh is worth mentioning um let us come down the line here from our friend Jason Glass. Um, STAs or experimental licenses are absolutely required to use laboratory amplifiers for RF over fiber IEM applications, with the exception of WYSIWYG. Um, basically not uh, just treating it like the Wild West. Right, yeah, and that I, I'm sure is one of the reasons why uh, PWS doesn't just sell a uh, transmit amplifier. Correct. Um, do you suggest any sort of redundancy for a fiber system? Um, sure. And yeah, and redundancy with any of these things are kind of, it's kind of an interesting discussion. Like I will for sure try and have 
uh, an additional piece of fiber if I can. Because like we talked about before, a lot of times you may be pulling like a TAC-12, like a 12-strand fiber from wherever your head end is to where your remote location is. And so it's, you know, a lot of times there's extra fiber there. And so we'll at least have cleaned and tested one more fiber path uh, in case we have trouble. Uh, if it's a real mission critical application, then you might uh, need to think about running a whole separate uh, fiber optic path that maybe, you know, I don't, it depends on what you're worried about. You know, is a forklift going to run over my fiber and damage it or is somebody going to kind of cut it? Like I've actually had a couple of situations recently where on uh, loadout they, you know, cut my fiber as they're trying to pull out other cabling. And so uh, it's it's a thing. Definitely you want to think about redundancy. Um, Non-used inputs on a multi-zone combiner, should they be terminated or no? Uh, we're talking about like a UX8? I'm guessing so. It was coming in during that portion of it. Yeah, sir. Certainly can't hurt. It's always a good idea to terminate unused inputs. Um, a lot of times with these Wilkinson combiners, they're not as sensitive to termination or not. So it may depend on the topology of your combiner, but it, it's always a good idea. Um, this would be a, uh, a production question on the PWS side. Uh, is the DB8 discontinued? Uh, I don't believe so. I could check with uh, Justin, who's our man in charge of that, but I think you can still still order them at this point. Um, that's uh, this last one here. Um, and so I think this is just more of a uh, best practices question, uh, kind of covering everything that we've talked about today. Yeah. Um, how would I cover IEMs for a 200 foot wide stage with LED screens covering the whole stage? Transmitters are placed in monitor world behind the LED screens. Yeah. So basically yeah. we're blocked by that and you have yeah. a much larger footprint than what you want to do with a standard coax. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll mention real quick. I've, I'm this just in, uh, DB8 still available while supplies last and eventually there they'll get phased go. out and replaced with Omegas. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the big bad LED wall is something that a lot of people have experienced interference with. And it's it's another one of those things, like I've seen LED walls that have well shielded power supplies with kind of metal uh, enclosures around them and they don't spew a bunch of RF. I've seen LED walls with, you know, very inexpensive power supplies and plastic enclosures that spew a lot of RF. And so um, your mileage may vary, but definitely, grab your spectrum analyzer, head over to the LED wall and start figuring out if it's sending out any interfering uh, signals in the range that you're wanting to operate your wireless systems. Mm -hmm. So beyond that, yeah, the that's maybe where we talked about before with the antenna side stage and antennas under the stage. That may be one of those things where if you've got a well shielded LED wall, you can put your, your transmit antenna side stage and it's great. If you have an LED wall that's noisy and getting your antennas underneath the stage, sort of directly underneath where the performers are standing, gives you better performance in that higher noise environment. So this would divert back to our series of compromises for a perfect situation. <laughs> it, yeah, well, engineering, as with so many things, it's all about making the right trade-offs. And having the right RF engineer available. <laughs> Yeah, everybody uh, should just hire Pete, and he'll just make it work, right? Well, exactly. no, I, 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 uh, my, my uh, uh, example of this this particular answer that, for this question is Jason Glass. Uh, he, I've seen him do shows, particularly challenging, where he's got lots of different bands coming in, and you know, bands come in with their monitor console and their racks of RF and everything, and they only bring 25-foot RF cables because they figure they're just going to set all their antennas on top of their rack and aim them on stage. Well, if your stage is ringed with a with a hanging wall of a, a chain or a, an LED wall, your RF just is not going through that. So as a matter of practice, he go he always hangs a truss out on the stage in front of the LED wall with a series of antennas that he runs back to yeah. the stage area and 
I'm sure rents those RF inputs at huge rates to the band when they come in. I, I, he's charging per frequency, right? I, I would um, think per, so. Per, yeah, yeah. And, well, another cool per thing hertz, that per hertz. You know, one one thing I've seen Jason do. I hope he doesn't mind me giving away some of his secrets, but he'll use one of his zones with. Uh, he just takes like an Omni antenna, like one of those Sennheiser. Uh, what's the Omni paddle? A ten. Uh, forget the number on it, but uh, the thing that has kind of an hourglass shape. Yeah, what's the number on that thing, Cody? Ten thirteen, maybe. Ten thirteen. Ten thirty one. Ten thirty one. Anyway, that he'll take one of those antennas as a second zone on like something like he's doing Jimmy Fallon, put it right underneath the guest chair, right? And so when somebody sits down on their body pack and attenuates that thing tremendously now, rather than having to rely on antennas that might be somewhere on the sides of the set, you've got an antenna that's right underneath their chair. So almost as almost as good as running the RF receive antenna to the transmitter pack on the host. Right, right. <laughs> So, all right. Well, I think yeah, we're just about five o'clock. We got uh, any more questions rolling in, or we've been keeping up on that? Okay. Uh, we've been keeping up. Uh, there's just a couple more uh, guys. We want to keep rolling through the couple more that there are here. Um, That'd be great. Okay. Right. Um, is there loss at zero on the DB8? So I think just having it uh, connected into your system. Yeah, it, it does depend a little bit on, uh, there's been different models of DB8 with different attenuators and different silk screening, but generally speaking, like if you were to order one now, if you set it to zero, that's unity gain. So there's internal amplification, but the internal amplification is set up to um, make up for the internal losses. And so if you put in a signal at, let's say, neg 30, it should come out at neg 30. Um, this is a great question. Uh, kind of goes back to what we were talking about with uh, multi-zone and our uh, overlapping. Um, is there a best practice uh, in antenna selection in multi-zone applications based on diversity for the front of house and stage example? Um, example, a paddle whip, uh, whip paddle, uh, et cetera. Any combination right. of antennas that we would generally want to follow or is there a rule of thumb here? Yeah, well, I like the example that Pete gave before about where it says, okay, I've got, let's say, a directional antenna aiming at the stage, and then I've got another directional antenna aiming backstage. And so now you've back to back these two directional antennas, so you're putting them where they're both much less sensitive. You know, so you're picking up the area that you care about and you're, you know, tailoring that overlap to be in the less sensitive part of the antenna. And I think the same thing, like if I can put antennas uh, aiming at what I want to pick up, and if I can have the less sensitive area towards my other zone, that's ideal. Uh, I've also seen this, even if it's not multi-zone, like um, I was working a, an event at the State Fair of Texas, and the, the main stage there, depending on which side of stage you set up on, you're either aiming your directional antennas right into all the local broadcast transmit towers or directly away from all those transmit towers. So. You know, you might want to think about that if you've got an option of which side of stage to set up on. Like, hey, if I can put all the local broadcast towers in the less sensitive part of my directional antennas, that's going to get me some additional advantage. Yeah, absolutely. And just going back to our uh, antenna selection talk earlier on and finding where the nulls of those are and uh, just, you know, using that in your RF environment and finding the best place for that. Right on. Um, just going back to the backbone of our system. Yeah. Um, what is your suggested use of the Sure Omni active antennas? Uh, I, boy, that's a new one for me. They make an Omni active antenna? Maybe uh, someone I don't else will chime in on that. I was maybe let's just assume uh, that is the Omni passive for right now. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, well, yeah, not even the Sure ones, but just when do you need an Omni antenna? You know, like. Uh, intercom application might be a good one where people are walking all around. You don't have a specific spot on stage where they're going to be, you know, constrained to. And so you want good even pickup all around where you're sitting. Or for that matter, maybe everybody's going to be very close, you know, corporate systems where, you know, you're setting up a receiver 
very close to where they're going to be up talking at a lectern or something. Like you don't really need all the extra gain of a paddle antenna or particularly an amplified paddle antenna at that point. Like you can get plenty of signal into the system with a um, straight up dipole antenna. And so if you've got enough signal with that, there's no reason to try and get, you know, extra complicated with it and just give you other points of failure. Um, all right, I think there's just uh, one or two more here. Um, does the Alpha Series multi-zone distribute power to your antenna? The Alpha does not have bias power on it. That's why it's kind of the entry level box. So you could use a bias T if you needed uh, bias power or you could look at the Omega once that's out. And uh, is there such thing where you can carry RF over any sort of cat cable? Uh, I know there are systems out there that will take RF and digitize it to put it on like some sort of computer network. Uh, I haven't used them myself. Uh, my understanding is obviously they're going to be more expensive than these systems that we're talking about. So it would only be something you'd consider if you didn't have a way to do the RF over fiber transport we've been talking about. All right. And uh, unless uh, you guys behind the curtain know of questions that I've missed here, I think we are uh, pretty much caught up. Well, I, I agree. I think this is a, a great spot where we um, just kind of sum up, you know, like I said at the beginning here, selfishly, this is one of my favorite topics. And, and you really hit it home, I think, here is that we can't think of RF over fiber the same way we think about data, the way we think about Dante or anything else. You know, we're so used to, hey, I'll throw an SFP in there and off I go, right? We're not talking about a media converter here, right? We're, we're talking about a lot more complexity to this signal. And so that was one of the things I, I really hope that everybody else watching got from this too, that, you know, we're, we're talking about RF over fiber because that is a natural progression that we're gonna see in the marketplace. It's something you should understand, but more importantly, you should understand it in the context of just how complex it really is. And a lot of times we'll, you know, I'm speaking to myself. Um, I love to design uh, things that sometimes create uh, solutions that are looking for a problem, right? And back to your point is it keep it simple, right? Whether it's an Omni antenna, um, not using any more power than you have to. Um, I just noticed a couple things that I wrote down uh, as you were going through too, is the, um, the filter before amplification, just simple things that we normally don't think about because we're like, oh man, I want to see everything, right? And then I want, I want weapons to maximum and I want to bring it all in and then, then I'll do all that. But it's, it's kind of counter that, right? And, um, the multi re, multi zone receive versus multi zone transmit receive straightforward that we can do that day in and day out the quadversity was an excellent example i thought of saying hey here's a box that's already doing this right do it just follow along you know your guys is building up the boxes that are more than just a throwdown solution right that that have a complete thought ready to go that's part of the reason we get that and finally at some point, call PWS, right? Call somebody up and go, this is a pretty big project I'm dealing with here. I think it's got a fair amount of complexity and you wanna get people engaged. Now, the most important thing we didn't talk about today, IAS. So, yeah. <laughs> it's coming back to the third It's screen. coming. Nobody needs to worry. We're gonna, you know, it's gonna get, it'll get a webinar all to itself, but this, there was a lot of a lot of stuff here and I would urge everybody, I'm including myself, I'm gonna go back in, scrub through this and watch this again because there were so many great examples of how this gets deployed, but you're right, when you start scaling that out, you get a lot of IEM mixes, RF over fiber, it's gonna be a bit more work. So um, Pete, Mac, you guys got any uh, closing thoughts you wanna share? Go Pete. There you go. And no mute button. Turn, Turn your mic off. off. There we go. Take your, hopefully you're, you, you'll have a spectrum analyzer on site and yeah. take your spectrum analyzer and plug it into the output of your receive combiner. 
So you actually see all your all your your antenna or your multi antennas or whatever they are, and look at all your frequencies through the antenna system, because uh, just because you have a whip backstage and the and the frequency looks good doesn't mean out on stage or out on stage with a, another antenna back in the dressing room right next to Joe Blow's walkie talkie is not getting all kinds of garbage in there. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Look, see what it's your antenna is seeing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was brought in to test a, a, a network's antenna system, uh, and and they said, "Oh, it keeps dropping out, keeps dropping out all over the place." And I go in the first day, I listen to the whole show. I just use a whip on there. Second day, I walked in, plugged my spectrum analyzer into their antenna system. It was early; nobody had gotten there yet, and all of a sudden the lighting gets turned on and the entire display noise floor goes through the ceiling. And I just yelled, turn off the lights. And I don't know why they did it. They turned the lights off and it went away. Yeah. And it turned out one of the receive antennas was three feet from a really poorly designed LED controller. And all they had to do was move their receive antenna 10 feet away from it and all their problems went away. And the reason was I was looking at it through their antenna system. And right, which included that one problem antenna. Which included that, that it, well, this particular network, each, in, each antenna system has antennas in every hallway, all the way down, every dressing room, the bathrooms, under the floor, and who knows where. So it, it, it's a great antenna system, but they put the antenna next to some garbage, garbage in, garbage in. Yeah, and when you're troubleshooting those multi-antenna systems, being able to break it apart into its separate zones is very helpful too. Yeah, very, very. And Absolutely. all I can say is I love the fact that the government has sold off the entire spectrum because it means more work for us. <laughs> it is getting harder to do higher channel count systems on shows. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah. I will so that they say that Henry Cohen did a 600 frequency coordination in uh, in vegas last time we were out there and he was he got a few more gray hairs but but it's possible i heard henry gets paid about, by the frequency uh, too right <laughs> yeah what's that henry's paid a, by the frequency yeah exactly. I heard a story yeah. about uh, or maybe jason not. glass doing the same thing in, in vegas earlier on this yeah, year right. yeah 600 we've all been there it's been there done that yeah you know and so, you know, for those uh, for those shows where you're not doing 600, um, we'll still have some complexity, but uh, you know, uh, just going to be different. And uh, I think this topic of uh, multi-zone isn't going anywhere. You know, whether it's touring, whether it's festival, whether it's any application, broadcast, you name it. You know, it's not necessarily high channel. I would be thinking about that. Reach out to these guys. Um, you know, uh, Pete, maybe you could throw up our slate there. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously they're in the business of selling services, all right? So don't send them a note saying, hey, will you design this for me for free, okay? What? Because, no, I know, I know, can you believe that? But um, but do dialogue with them. Um, I'll tell you what, one of the things I'm learning about through COVID is people people are willing to share. Um, there's a lot of information out there um, but when you need that implementation, you need to reach out. You need to recognize, hey, I need others involved here and uh, and bring them in. Meanwhile, this Friday, RF Faraday cage, all right? We're going to have uh, a handful of folks in there just throwing out every example of good and hopefully bad, really bad implementation that still worked, which in our industry is good, right? Show still happened, but it defied the laws of physics. Pretty rare, but it happens. And, uh, you know, in between during this week, lunch with A2's lunch tomorrow, right? So we'll ask them a few questions about what do they enjoy about, you know, humping RF gear around the uh, the stadium or a ballroom or, uh, you know, uh, open field, if, you name it. But if they'd know. rather run out a big old giant piece of LMR, six or lmr 400 or a little fiber cable i don't know which one they'd rather do but well i think they want the one that works reliably and it requires the fewest amount of trips for them to go out there and that's gonna vary right we learned that today pete everything can't go on fiber 
But yeah, but every um, no, it has to all go on fiber. That's the rule. It all go on fiber, including our carbon headsets. So exactly to that end, everybody, thank you for joining us, Gary. Thank you, Cody, for your time. Um, uh, thank you, PWS, for yours. And uh, we'll be uh, looking uh, to the next time. And everybody, keep tuning in and uh, watching. Yeah, thanks, thanks for putting this together, guys. It was great. Thanks, You're guys. Very, very much appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, guys. All right. So long. Bye-bye.